Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for having me um, here today. Um, as, as Donna mentioned, sleep's um, a little bit of a, a passion of mine. I became um, increasingly interested uh, in it over the years of working with patients both in treatment and sort of post-treatment and recognising um, how disrupted a lot of people's sleep becomes, but also how important it is to just getting by each day, to having a good night's sleep. So um, we actually developed um, what's called the Can Sleep program here at Peter Mac, where we developed um, a resource for, for patients to look at and, and use. And I've put a few actually over on the, um, the table over there. I don't have enough copies for everybody, but you can also download it very easily from the internet um, on just Google Can Sleep and Peter Mac. Uh, and the aim is really to, to look at cognitive and behavioural methods of improving sleep. Okay, so it's, which we know are, are more effective longer term than medications, whereas often people um, first go to medications because it seems sort of like the simplest way forward uh, when desperate for sleep. But I, today I'm going to really talk about the, um, the cognitive and behavioural methods of trying to improve sleep, uh, and hopefully we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. So just to begin, um, a lot of people don't realise that, that sleep problems such as insomnia are really common in people with cancer, and that includes people who have finished their active cancer treatment um, many years past. Up to about 60% will report significant ongoing sleep problems, some of whom will have insomnia disorder itself. Okay. Sleep problems can also then affect partners and vice versa. So if your partner has a sleep problem, it's probably going to affect you. And if you have a sleep problem, it'll probably affect your partner. Um, so I hope if you go away today with some ideas, you might want to share this with your partner or, or your family or your housemates or whoever you live with, uh, because it's often, it often takes a bit of joint effort as a household to try and work on some of these these problems. Um, and the, the trouble with sleep problems is they can, be, they can kind of become a bit of a vicious cycle that, that perpetuates over time. Um, and so they can go on for a long time and for many years for some people, which is um, really difficult to live with. So the Can Sleep um, booklet, as I mentioned, a couple of copies over there, it's free to download uh, from the internet and it will contain um, all the information that I'm going to talk through with you today, but a little bit more detail. And I find that people dip in and out of it and say that it's really useful in just giving them ideas of what they can do to improve their sleep. So I really encourage you after this session, if sleep is an issue for you, to go away hopefully today with some ideas, but to download the booklet and to keep referring to it as a resource and a reminder for you um, to use into the future. We do actually offer appointments for patients of Peter Mac to actually come in as well and have a, a consultation so that we can really um, point you in the direction of the specific strategies that are most helpful for you. So if you're a patient of Peter Mac here, you're welcome to call the Can Sleep program and inquire about an appointment with us here. So just launching in then, to begin, it's really, really important to understand the factors that determine sleep, because these are the things that if you're not getting enough sleep, that you're going to want to really take a look at for yourself and try and improve and change. And the first is what we call sleep drive. And it effectively means how hungry your body is for sleep. Um, so when we go to bed at night time, we should have a high sleep drive. We should be very sleepy because that will help you fall asleep and that will help you stay asleep. Um, things like naps, which some people absolutely need, but a nap, it's a bit like snacking before a big meal. Your, your appetite is decreased, so you're not quite as ready for sleep and you won't go to sleep as quickly and you won't stay asleep so well. So sleep drive is a really important factor. And um, we'll come back to this throughout because lots of things you do during the day and even at night in your sleep pattern will then impact the next... Um, day's sleep drive for you. The second factor is our body clock, uh, also known as the circadian rhythm. So this is a, an internal mechanism in our bodies that tells our body when we should be awake and it's, it, it sort of sends alerting signals to keep us awake and, and alert, ideally. And then at night time, to reduce those alerting signals so that our body, uh, bodies are, are more easily relaxed, um, we wind down a lot more, and sleep comes a lot more easily. And there are a couple of factors that really contribute to keeping our body clock 
to a, a, a schedule that works for us. And the first and very significant uh, factor is, of course, light. Because when it's light outside, typically we are, are awake and up and doing things. And when it's dark outside, typically that is the time when our bodies uh, will want to sleep. So light is a really important cue. Um, and of course, with electronics and electricity, we have a lot of light in the evenings and, and at night time. And that, of course, becomes a bit of a modern problem of sleep. And I'll talk again a bit more about that later. But other cues really contribute to our body clock and our body's capacity to know when to sleep. Uh, so even regularity of meals and exercise and your daily routines feed into your body clock. So um, thinking about what routines you have and that regularity can really make a big difference in telling your body when it's time to sleep and when it's time to wake and, in, and therefore in assisting you to get to sleep and particularly at night. The third and really important factor is having a quiet mind. And of course, when you have cancer or when you've had cancer, you often have an awful lot of things to worry about and to think over and to possibly feel um, stressed and concerned about. Um, daily life and uh, all the things that come with it means that everybody is susceptible at period, to have periods of time when our brains are just a bit busier than normal. You might be thinking over something that's even exciting or you're looking forward to, but, but it means that your brain is, is just working a bit faster than normal. Um, and unfortunately, when our brains are very busy, it sort of overrides or it can override the, the normal cues and the normal body signals to sleep. Uh, including sleep drive and the circadian rhythm signals. So uh, attaining or knowing how to manage your mind uh, and your emotions um, can really, really help with improving sleep. And of course, aside from these big factors, there are all the environmental factors. So in terms of the comfort of your bed, the body temperature at night time, noise, uh, neighbours, dogs bark barking, things like that, that all feed into sleep. But these are three really important factors we'll talk more about. So just quickly, um, co common sleep problems are difficulties falling asleep, staying asleep, uh, early waking, or excessive daytime sleepiness. So we talk often also of acute insomnia or acute periods of poor sleep. So they may be, might be, say, a week or two long, maybe a little longer, and are often caused by something going on in, in your life or some sort of situational stressor. Um, and when that situational stressor goes away, your sleep um, often will return back to normal. Chronic insomnia, however, is when you don't, your sleep doesn't return to normal. And this is uh, what I think a lot of people with cancer experience is that there are so, there's so much going on um, that sleep really gets into um, a difficult um, pattern and then stays problematic even when uh, maybe life gets a little bit e easier or you, you're not feeling stressed. So chronic insomnia generally is what we say when it's gone on for three months or longer and typically is, is bad enough to be impacting your daytime functioning. So when you you feel like your brain is just not as um, clear, your thinking isn't as, as clear as normal, um, that you're very tired all the time, you don't have the energy to do the things you might like to do, that is obviously impact, going to impact your, your daytime functioning and your quality life. And so this is where we say this is a, pro a problem. So as mentioned, there is a little bit of a vicious cycle thing but it, it, that happens and it's helpful to understand this because this is also where you can start targeting the factors that might, might be maintaining and keeping your sleep problem um, going on over time. So what happens just at the top, typically sleep is disturbed for some reason, um, whatever it is, and people feel tired and frustrated because they're not sleeping. So you might be start lying awake at night uh, wishing to sleep, trying to sleep, imagining the, the next day ahead of you and you're going to be tired. And then, of course, though having those feelings and experiencing that frustration and stress will make it harder to get to sleep. So then the next day you're even tireder. Some people might um, do things to make up for that loss of sleep, like have a nap or drink extra coffee or sleep in or go to bed earlier the next night. And all of these things might mean that you don't, um, you're not as sleepy at the next bedtime. You're a bit uh, overstimulated with caffeine or you've had that nap so your sleep drive isn't as high. And so once again then your sleep is disturbed the next night and the pattern continues over time. So if you're struggling with sleep, think about what, what might you be doing that actually 
in the short term might help you catch up on sleep, but in the longer term not, not help the next night's sleep. Um, a couple of t really important takeaway messages today is that sleep problems, including insomnia, can be improved. The cognitive and behavioural strategies I'm going to talk about um, are extremely successful in people uh, with cancer. Um, and uh, we really recommend that you give these a go. You have to take a multi-pronged approach. There's not usually one factor that's causing a sleep problem. There's usually many that are contributing to it. So we say identify all the things that are a problem for you and commit to four to six weeks of change to, to make uh, your sleep better. It does take time for your body to get used to new habits and for those habits then to pay off in terms of getting better sleep. Um, some people, sorry, this is a slight uh, repeat of the previous one. Some people like to keep a sleep diary as well as they go through to kind of, you might have an idea of where your sleep is, is going wrong or what's happening to it, but actually sometimes keeping a sleep diary is quite enlightening and helps you see exactly what's going on. Is it falling asleep? Is it waking a lot, up a lot in the middle of the night? Is it, is it early waking? How often does it actually happen? Um, but some people don't really uh, want to keep that, that degree of detail of their sleep, and that's fine, but it can be really helpful for some people. All right, so the first thing I guess I'd like to talk about is developing healthy thoughts about sleep and to sort of suggest that you, you go away and think about what beliefs about sleep you bring uh, to your relationship with sleep. Um, and, and are these beliefs that you hold, are they accurate? Um, and even if you think they are accurate, um, are they helpful to think about at night time when you're not sleeping? And this is the trap that people often get into, is when particularly they're not sleeping well, they start to really worry about sleep uh, related to their beliefs about what they need, how much sleep they need, what's going to happen if you don't sleep as well as you might like. Some examples might be, I need eight hours of sleep a night or I can't function. It's a really common belief that you need eight hours of sleep a night. And on average, that's probably fairly accurate, but some people function really well on four or five hours and other people actually need more than eight hours. So what's right for you might be different to what you believe you should be getting or what is important for you. So it's really helpful to actually identify some of those thoughts and beliefs that you might have and, and kind of challenge them a little bit or, or replace them with a different thought that is a bit more calming. So even if the belief is, is accurate, um, one bad night's sleep is not the end of the world. It might feel like it, it might feel awful, but you might be able to challenge just how um, difficult that's going to be for you. Of course, it's kind of easy to say this, just change your thoughts, um, particularly in the middle of the night when you're not sleeping and it's dark and cold. It's very easy to get very caught up in your thoughts and, and worried about sleep. But just, just notice those thoughts and challenge them or reframe them when you can. Um, the next strategy I'm going to talk about is actually a really, really important one, and we know it works really well when people have insomnia, which is when your body has kind of learned not to sleep at night time in bed. Because insom insomnia is when you've, you've become so um, not sleeping at night, is happening so often, that your body has actually learned that bed and bedtime is about being awake rather than asleep. And so to reteach your body and mind to associate the bed with sleep, it's really important to avoid all non-sleep activities um, in the bedroom. So stop reading in bed, don't watch television in bed anymore, don't check your phone and email in bed, don't work on your laptop in bed. Take all of those things, do them, but do them outside of the bedroom and restrict bed to just being about going to sleep. So when you go to bed, go to bed, turn out the lights um, and uh, don't do anything else. Um, and so the same holds for naps. If you nap during the day, nap in your bedroom. Because if you nap on the couch, your body learns that that's where you should be falling asleep and it stops learning that actually you should be falling asleep in your, in your bedroom. Um, so bed should be a place for sleep and sleep alone. 
Along with this are a couple of really key strategies. Uh, don't watch the clock. A lot of people are check, ch start checking the clock and really, are, you know, wanting to know how, what time is it, how long till morning, how long have they been awake. Um, but it's really unhelpful. It Again, it actually alerts you. It will wake you up. It's, it gets your brain ticking over in ways that you don't want in the middle of the night when you're trying to get back to sleep. So if you need to wake at a certain time, set the alarm um, and turn your clock around so you just can't see it in the middle of the night. If you wake up, uh, it doesn't really matter what time it is. Um, you know it's, you probably know it's going to be dark outside um, and just do what you need to do. The second strategy is if you don't fall to sleep in about 20 minutes, then staying in bed just teaches you that bed is about not sleeping. And usually after 20 minutes or so, you start to get a bit frustrated and start thinking about sleep and when am I going to fall asleep? And so again, that will w wake you up and won't be helpful to stay in bed while feeling a bit, bit stressed and frustrated. So if you can't go to sleep after about 20 or 30 minutes, the, this is really important, try and get out of bed and leave the bedroom and go into another room. And a lot of people say, well, why would I do that? I really want to go to sleep. Leaving the room will just wake me up even more. And again, it probably will wake you up a little bit, but staying in bed, getting more frustrated about sleeping, because 20 minutes, if you haven't fallen asleep, you're probably not going to, not for a while. So it's better to actually leave the bedroom and wake up and do something that's really distracting and calming so that you, you stop thinking about sleep, you stop worrying about sleep. And when your body feels sleepy at that point in time, Go back to the bedroom and give yourself another 20, 30 minutes to fall asleep again. And again, what that means is then you limit all that non-sleep time to being outside the bedroom and to when you do sleep, um, it's, it's uh, when you're in bed, you are actually sleeping most of the time. This is really effective at teaching your body that when, when, you're, when you see that your bed, when you go into your bedroom, it's time for sleep. And our bodies really do respond to those cues quite strongly. Um, a second really important strategy, which a lot of people don't know about, is sometimes to spend less time in bed. And I see this a lot with people who have cancer, who often um, have a lot of issues with tiredness and fatigue uh, and feel that rest is really important, and, and it is, um, but will often go to lengths to give themselves as much opportunity as possible to get more sleep. So we'll start going to bed earlier and earlier and often sleeping in more and more in order to give that window of opportunity for sleep um, to make it as big as possible. The problem with that is that uh, you're then spending a lot of time trying to sleep. So a lot of people say, to, but, but not sleeping. So a lot of people might say to me, I, I only sleep, I only get about six, six hours sleep a night, but I'm spending 10 or 11 hours in bed trying to sleep. So again, that's really in, inefficient in many, in many ways. And so what we suggest is that you restrict the window of time that you spend in bed to about the time of hours of sleep that you're actually getting. Uh, how you do this uh, you can be very detailed with a, with a practitioner, a psychologist, for example, who's trained in sleep and fill in a diary and we work out exactly how we should r reduce your window of sleep. So what time to go to bed and what time to wake up. Um, and it, it is important to not overdo this and to get this wrong. You can end up feeling sleepier if you restrict your window of, of, of sleep too much. So I don't recommend that you go home and, and only um, stay in bed for four hours and give yourself that much time to sleep because you've, you're only getting four hours sleep a night. Um, that will probably contribute to excessive sleepiness during the daytime and um, won't, be, won't be helpful. Um, but it can be, if you really are spending 10 hours in bed and only getting six hours of sleep, it's probably easier to just move your bedtime back a little bit, get up a little bit earlier each morning, just, just shorten that window a little bit. It means that by the time you go to bed, you're sleepier, your sleep drive will work with your body to get you to sleep faster and to get you to stay to sleep. Uh, longer, and for some people, just a small change in the in in their bedtime and wake time routines can really make a difference in um, in the quality of their sleep. 
If you have any concerns for yourself, do consult with a, with a health professional, such as a psychologist or your doctor, to work out what's going to be right for you, because everyone has different, um, everyone is different and everyone has different uh, personal factors that might play into the decisions about when you go to bed and, and when you want to get up in the morning. Your sleep environment is really important, and some of this is, is uh, kind of very straightforward things, but, but often we forget to think about some, some of these uh, simple strategies. How comfortable is your mattress? Do you need earplugs at night to block out noise? Um, do you need uh, eye, eye shades to block out light if you, if you don't have curtains that are light blocking? Um, do you need a white noise machine to kind of help block out external sounds like traffic and dog, dog barking? We know that white noise doesn't interfere with sleep. And there's some really good free apps you can get on your phone to just have that, that, that static sound, that shh sound in the background. Um, for some people, it might be about wearing suitable bed clothes. So a lot of people have hot flushes uh, or changes in body temperature and difficulties with that after cancer treatment. Um, and there's no quick and easy fix for that, but just being, uh, you know, making your environment as optimal as possible so that you can um, manage the, the body temperature changes or changes in, in your room, if your room also changes temperature in summertime, for example, when it's very hot, uh, and how you might quickly and easily um, shed clothes or bed covers or, um, or, or gain them when, you, when you're cold again. Um, considering things like heaters and air conditioning. You know, bringing a fan into your bedroom can even be a simple solution for some people. So good sleep habits are really, really important. Um, and it's really helpful, again, for your body to have a ritual and a routine around preparing for bed. Try and get ready for bed before you're tired um, and avoid energising activities just prior to bed. Um, and ideally avoid screen time, which is, uh, is computer screens emit a form of light called blue light, which um, uh, wakes us up effectively. It's like getting up in the morning, uh, it tells our body that we should be awake. Uh, and at night time, we should be dimming the lights uh, and then melatonin will increase in our body and, and allow us to or help us get to sleep. So just think about your exposure to light. Uh, in the evening time. It doesn't mean you have to turn off all the lights, sit in the dark and not ever use a computer. It's just, I'm just suggesting that you think about how much you use. You can dim screens, you can put blue light filters on, you can put a couple of lamps on in the living room rather than have all the lights on. So even making those subtle changes can make quite a difference again to feeding into your body clock and the signals that we're giving to it. Um, Okay, so I'm going to move through this a little quickly. Again, having regular bedtimes are, are, are really helpful. But more importantly, it's important that you go to bed when you're sleepy. So some people say, I go to bed at 10 o'clock every night and I've been told I should have a really regular bedtime. The problem with that is sometimes you're sleepy at quarter to 10 and sometimes you're sleepy at 10.30, but at 10 o'clock you might not be sleepy. We actually kind of move in and out of sleepiness um, in rhythms through the day. And it's much better to go to bed around the same time, but when you actually feel sleepy, okay? However, it is extremely helpful to have a regular wake-up time. And then as soon as you wake up to expose yourself to as much light as possible, turn on all the lights in the, in the, in the house, go outside with your cup of tea and coffee if you want, um, that will set your body clock for the day and, and it will know therefore at night time, your body will know when it's time for bed. And the more regular you keep that wake time, the more your body will get into that very regular rhythm. Um, and, and believe me, I've, tri I've trialled um, regularity of wake times myself and a week of consistent wake time you will you will absolutely notice a difference of course on weekends you know most people want to sleep in a little bit but if you can actually keep a consistent wake time it's um it's very powerful so naps for some people they absolutely need naps and naps are um, a way of managing energy and fatigue 
However, again, it's like having a snack before a meal. If you have a nap, it will take away, uh, it will reduce your sleep drive. So at night time, you might not be as sleepy and ready for bed. So if you do need to have a nap, try and plan it and try and schedule it. Um, try and have a nap before three o'clock and keep it fairly short. So 30 minutes um, and at a regular time of day, if possible. Eating healthily, eating regular meals, avoiding meals just prior to bed, drinking sufficient fluids to assist in body temperature control, um, avoiding alcohol. Uh, alcohol might make you feel really sleepy, but it, it messes with the quality of your sleep. So you can sleep a lot, but you won't have the deep sleep that, that is most res restorative. Um, and avoiding stimulants such as, as nicotine where possible. Again, for some people, just tweaking these things can be really powerful. And exercise. Exercise is something that I, I will tell everyone to do, obviously. It, it's so helpful for our emotional well-being, um, for treatment side effects, um, for sleep, and there's very strong evidence um, for its general benefits for people with cancer. But And it's good to be active during the daytime. Again, it helps us get to sleep at night. However, of course, adjust exercise to you and your situation. For some people, um, going out and going to the gym is, of course, not at all possible. And exercise might be literally walking up and down the hallway a few times um, every day. So really be careful and, and, and do what you need. Uh, try not to exercise just in the hours before bedtime. It's really helpful to think about all the cancer-related factors that interfere with sleep, and there are, of course, a lot of them. And the Can Sleep booklet goes through and has quite a lot of recommendations from, from doctors, nurses, and practitioners on how to manage some of these symptoms and side effects, which can be ongoing for many people, and be very disruptive for sleep. So I really encourage you to uh, have those conversations with your doctors if you haven't. Really put it on the table as an agenda to talk about and to see how you can manage that and therefore improve your sleep at night time. Managing your emotional health is a very important part of getting a better night's sleep. Um, stress, worry and low mood can all interfere with sleep and therefore managing those as best you can and trying to minimise their impact is really helpful. And there's an awful lot that you can do on your own by yourself um, uh, to, to, to improve these. Um, for some people, though, it's really helpful to, to seek professional help, so from a counsellor, a psychologist, um, a GP, um, as, as examples. Things to consider as part of daily self-care that we know are quite good in lowering stress levels and helping people just feel a bit, a bit calmer, and of course when we want to sleep, that's how we want to be, are things like um, mindfulness or meditation practice. Um, deep breathing exercises, progressive muscle relaxation, which is um, a way of relaxing your muscles and body as well as your mind, using relaxation scripts. Um, you can get great CDs and apps for all of these things, uh, often free on the internet. Uh, using positive visual imagery. All of these things can be woven into daily routines to try and optimise your well-being. Some people, though, worry Worry seems to override everything and really comes to the forefront at night time when, when sleepy. So it's important to find ways of getting your worry out uh, of your brain, out of your mind, um, before night time. Um, and to slow your mind down a little bit. Um, so it might be actually around doing some of your worrying and actively worrying during the daytime and setting a time of the day where that is your job. Your job is actually to think over all those worries that usually sort of creep in in the middle of the night um, and think about them, write them down, talk with a friend, be as problem solving as you can uh, and acknowledge the problems that you can't solve um, and do that earlier on in the day so that in the evening or when you're trying to get to sleep at night, when these worries crowd in again, you can say to yourself, I've done that worrying for today and I'll do it again tomorrow in the afternoon, but now is not the time. And you can let go of those worries because you, know, you can tell your brain that you've already done that work. And for some people, that can be really, really helpful. I'm going to briefly touch upon a couple of other things. There's obviously a lot of over-the-counter and home remedies that people um, look into for sleep, and I've got a few listed there. I'd, um, 
What's disappointing, I guess, is that we, there's not a lot of good quality research on any of these. So a lot of people swear by them. There's lots of anecdotes of how well these work. But we don't really know how well they work, how effective they are, um, whether you're getting value for your money. And these things can cost a lot of money. Um, and whether the hope and the, um, the, the effort that you put into taking these is actually going to pay off. Um, and so seek professional advice. Make sure they don't... Um, uh, interfere with any other treatments that you're having. Um, but these are common things that people are interested in and, and might want to look into further for themselves. Um, we're not entirely clear of how well they work. We're not entirely clear of their risks either. But there's more research. There is more research coming out on all of these. Um, a lot of people do use prescription medications. And while some of the strategies I've spoken to you about today are internationally recognised as the gold standard treatment for insomnia. So these behavioural techniques have better outcomes and longer term benefits and less side effects than medications. However, for some people, medications are a genuine option um, that is worthy of considering, but absolutely talk to your doctor about it. Um, but try and integrate it into the cognitive behavioural strategies as well. Okay, Obviously, with medications, sleep medications, we do know that they have issues such as tolerance, side effects, withdrawal, and sometimes times contraindications with other medications. So only use these under uh, with health professional input. Um, they tend to help sleep, but they don't necessarily get at the causes of your poor sleep, which is why, again, the cognitive behavioural model is uh, one that we recommend as well. Um, do reach out for health professional advice in terms of your physical symptoms, uh, your stress and worry, or, spe or specifically your sleep patterns and habits. There's lots of people out there who um, are happy to talk about this and help help uh, you with your sleep problem. Also, I just want to quickly acknowledge that there are a lot of other types of sleep problems. So there's medically based sleep problems such as sleep apnea uh, and restless leg syndrome. These are medical conditions that need to be treated and assessed by a medical doctor or a sleep specialist. Um, and so if you suspect that, uh, that you might have something medical going on underlying a sleep problem, do go and speak with your GP, get a referral to a specialist and get those things checked out. There's, a, again, higher rates in, in people who've had cancer of sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome. So we, we always screen in our program for these problems and we refer and get people um, checked medically. Take home messages, sleep problems are treatable. Seek professional assistance if you need. Try and identify all the contributing factors that are going on for you. Work out a plan and commit to it for four to six weeks. Um, and so I really hope that um, today's given you a few ideas and uh, I wish you the very best with your sleep problems. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. I know there's a lot of tips that I should probably adopt. <laughs> um, is there any questions? Hi, my name is Nora. Thanks for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask uh, if you had any suggestions um, for the non-stimulating activities before bedtime, the ones that you suggested to do outside of the bedroom. Yeah, so um, you mean in the middle of the night when you're sleeping or uh, when, you're, when you'd like to be asleep or, or even just in the lead up before bedtime? Yeah, so the, it's, the aim is to give you something else to think about and focus on that isn't obsessing over not sleeping, okay? So um, that, might, that might look quite differently, different for different people. Um, we, we might throw out ideas all the time in terms of do some stretches, um, do some yoga, do some um, relaxation. Um, but for some people, they say they just end up, they still end up in their head. Um, thinking about sleep, worrying about sleep. And so watching the a television, watching YouTube on the internet, um, doing some emails, doing pottering around the house, doing some chores, all of those things are absolutely fine. All we'd say is um, brainstorm the best things for you to do. You want to allow yourself to get sleepy again. So you, you don't want to be vacuuming, probably, um, in the middle of the night. It's probably going to wake you up. You probably don't want to be watching a really exciting thriller or action movie. Um, but you want to be watching something that's get, getting you out of that sort of head space of, being, of thinking about sleep all the time. So pick a gentle movie or a short-term ironing. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Again, think for you. So, I mean, for some people, catching up on emails is really kind of relaxing and okay. And for other people, that just is not a pleasant experience. And so I'd say yes to one person and no to one per another person with that. So does that help? And again, just keep the lights low. We have to be realistic. Again, you can't uh, just sit in the dark waiting to get sleepy again. We don't really want you to do that. You want to be doing something that is pleasurable but calming and distracting. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, questions here. I more had some practical advice for everyone else in the crowd. Um, there is another over-the-counter product which you may have heard of called uh, Rescue Remedy, um, and it, there's one for sleep as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does contain St John's wort, so it's not to be taken with other antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medications. However, um, I found that some patients report that it's very good in terms of helping them to relax and not off to sleep. Um, but if you do have questions about uh, some supplements that you want to take for sleep, uh, Peter Mac has a very good drug information service. So if you want to um, take your medications into the pharmacy, they'll actually go through them in depth with you and provide you with feedback around if they're okay to take together. So that's been successful for me and my patients. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And a lot of other hospitals or pharmacists will do that too, yeah. Any other questions over the side? Right. <laughs> Hard to run in heels. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Carmel. I just wanted to let you know that I've been doing Justine's program, so I don't know if you recognise this. Me. Absolutely. And I've been able yeah. to take a lot of tips, especially from the book. Not everything, but some things, and I'm getting there. So I'm not sleeping well, but I'm a lot better than what I was. So I'm getting there. That's fantastic feedback. Thank you. Well done. And um, I just. The, the links to the um, the fact book, the sleep book, I will put on um, our website and I'll also um, could send out the links to all these um, uh, supports as well. So, is there any other questions? We've just got like, one more. Time for one more. One more, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, I just had a question about being on sleep medication because I was on that medication while I was on chemo. Um, but I'm still taking it because I got used to taking it, I guess, in terms of falling asleep and staying asleep. Mm. What are your suggestions in terms of going off the medication? Yeah, that's a really, really good question um, because a lot of people do want to come off the sleep medications and aren't entirely sure how. I'd absolutely recommend going to your GP or talking with your oncologist about a plan to slowly wean off those medications because they, they do need to be done in a controlled way. If you, if you just go to cold turkey, sometimes it can actually give you the opposite impact and it will um, make you very sleepless. So you want to come off in a controlled way under medical supervision. But I'd absolutely recommend that you get into the cognitive behavioural strategies, um, if not alongside, but a little bit before trying to do that. So you, you want to work on the, the, the cognitive and behavioural strategies to actually get your routines and your rhythms uh, and your, your headspace optimised for sleep to work. And then when you slowly wean off the, the medications, you should find that your sleep is... In, not, not only um, no worse, but actually hopefully improving. And that way you, you feel probably more in control of coming off the sleep medications um, and you'll know what to do if you don't sleep. And you'll know how to, how to catch up and, and how not to worry so much about sleep and not feel that, that reliance on the medications. It's a great question though, because a lot of people need to go through that. But use the CBT um, alongside uh, for a, a short period of time and then slowly work with your doctor to wean off. Yeah, good luck. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Justine. That was Thank fantastic. Thank you very much. And hope it's been helpful.